This is Donna Prosser. I am the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And we're really excited to be joined again by our friend, Dr. Ed Kelly with the World Health Organization to give us an update on what's happening with the pandemic. Ed, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful, wonderful. Nice to see you, Ed. Nice to see you too. All right, so I think, uh, I know we have a lot to, to get to today, so let's go ahead and, and jump on and get started. Good, thanks so much, uh, uh, Donna. And, um, you know, I'm adopting uh, with, you know, a significant paperwork was involved, but an appropriate California kind of look for uh, today's briefing, if that's okay with my <laughs> formal virtual background here, but um, and a nod to, uh, Patient Safety Movement Foundation and, and everybody uh, in the U.S. Um, and also summertime. It's uh, it, it's warm here, very warm here in Geneva, which for Geneva is like, you know, in the low 80s. So everyone's uh, going around fanning themselves. But um, uh, so I'd like to, with thanks again for the foundation for having us uh, back, I'd, I'd like to uh, go through a bit of an update, you know, we use these periodic um, connect points as a chance to update uh, foundation and colleagues uh, on where we are globally on the outbreak. Um, and also what are some of the things we're seeing and some of the work that we're doing. And it's also an opportunity to, uh, for us to, uh, um, if not in the Q&A session, but afterwards to connect with folks who may have uh, ideas or input for us. And, and I think there are a couple of areas that I'm I would really like to get feedback uh, during the Q&A session or, or afterwards. Um, uh, and uh, it's also, we're undertaking this during a time when our team, the patient safety team, is working full steam on uh, World Patient Safety Day, which comes in September, and also on the, the Global Action Plan on Patient Safety, which uh, member states asked us to produce uh, in time for next year's World Health Assembly. Uh, in person or not in person, um, it'll be produced. And so, um, you know, right now we find ourselves probably in the midst of the biggest uh, global incident in patient safety ever. And so I think this is a, it's an opportunity, but also very overwhelming. So maybe I can go to the next, uh, or my first slide um, next. Uh, Dr. Tedros has really flagged the idea that um, minimizing healthcare disruptions caused by COVID-19 is going to be uh, the key to managing the overall impact of this outbreak, uh, morbidity and, and mortality. And I think that, that um, the uh, ability of health systems and health services to keep essential services up and running is a real canary in the coal mine for the wider um, issues that societies face as they try to maintain, uh, the, either open up uh, post um, lockdowns and maintain essential services and their economies. Uh, so I think this is, it's of uh, highest importance. And next slide. What I'd like to do is just give us a quick update and then, and then run through a few items on, that we've been working on in terms of assessments uh, and guidance, but also to flag for uh, some of the attendees today, um, this global uh, collaboration that exists, the, the ACT Accelerator, which is Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, um, and the health systems work there, given where patient safety and, and the rest of the essential health services sit uh, in that. Um, and then I just finish with a picture of um, what countries are doing, or in some cases not doing, unfortunately, in terms of responding to COVID. Uh, next slide. So just in terms of the global epi uh, situation, this, um, I won't spend too much time on it, but it gives you a picture of the cases we've seen. This is just a, as of today, our report out. It does not have the United States um, numbers in it. Uh, we, for the past three weeks, have had a strange uh, anomaly. If we were doing this on Tuesday, we would have all the numbers, but um, an anomaly over the weekend that CDC reports too late for us to have it in our morning numbers that have to go out in time for the uh, waking up Western Pacific. Um, but I'm sure they'll come back. But uh, the, you know, there's 200,000 um, uh, new cases in the last 24 hours. I'm sure it will be a lot higher. Um, we hit our biggest day ever, uh, just the day before yesterday since the start of the outbreak. Um, we've now crossed into the 15 million cases. Uh, for reference, it took us five days to go from uh, 14 million to 15 million cases. 
to go from 1 million to 2 million cases, it took 93 days. So uh, anyway, um, still a lot of numbers there to, to look at. Next uh, slide, please. This gives you the, the numbers, but week by week, and you can see last week was our biggest week since the start. Um, you don't have to be an epi uh, um, uh, expert or stats expert to see we are not headed in the right direction, either in terms of cases or in terms of deaths that both have ticked up uh, recently um, in, a, in a sizable uh, in a sizable way. Um, in terms of uh, the statistics um, by region on the next slide, uh, you can see uh, it gives a picture of sort of the shape of the curve and case fatality rates. The cases are in the bar chart and the line is the um, uh, death rates. You can see um, in our Africa region, our Pan America region just below it, um, and in the Southeast Asia region, all uh, classic epi explosion curves, just really uh, upward uh, curve go headed way up. Um, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, they've seen some dipping of the curve, and you can see in the Western Pacific, there's a, a what's clear is a second wave um, come. We've had issues in Hong Kong and elsewhere uh, that uh, of cases in long-term care facilities, a, a topic that I'll come back to. And you can also even see in Euro that little Flip at the back, things were dipping lower and it's ticked upwards. Um, as I was um, uh, talking with um, US based family over the weekend, they're saying, oh, he's so lucky to live in um, France and Switzerland. And I do think that they're, uh, you know, the numbers um, vary greatly around the world, but uh, both France and Switzerland, for example, as two countries who did, a, who did a relatively good job at managing the case numbers, have both seen an upward tick. Um, but just in comparison, if you look at per 100,000 uh, population, the last about four weeks, France went from 2.8 to 3.8 to 4.4 to 6.8. So a gradual increase. Switzerland went from 2.4 to 7.2 to 8.1 and then 8.6. Um, in that same period, unfortunately, the U.S. went from 73 per 100,000. So uh, approximately 35 times what France was um, to 96 to 136 to 141 per 100,000 for the same time period. So anyway, um, everyone can work on things. It's just that some of us maybe can be working a little harder than, than others. Next slide. Uh, so, I mean, I think one of the, the issues that we have really tried to wrestle with is this um, getting a handle on how, quote unquote, disrupted our essential services. We've We've done some work uh, looking at the pandemic across 25 different essential health service lines. Um, and uh, the, the survey closed at the beginning of the month. We've still gotten a few uh, countries giving us more information. This gives a little bit of a, the background on it. And then the next slide, the, here we try to summarize a few of the bullet points. Um, basically, most countries have taken steps to identify a core set of essential services. So these are the things we are gonna to try to really keep offering during the outbreak. And then other stuff we're going to put on hold, voluntary surgeries, in some cases, dental uh, th th services like uh, non-essential dental care, et cetera. Um, the, but the issue is that um, on both sides, even though most countries have defined uh, those services, um, only about half of those country governments have provided any additional funding. And if you look across the service uh, provision areas worldwide, about half of essential services across the world are in, in disrupted in some way. And obviously, uh, assisted disrupting assisted deliveries has a much bigger impact than disrupting perhaps rehab care. But still, uh, it's a big impact across many services, even all the way down to emergency services being disrupted. And down at the bottom, we show some of the um, issues that countries flag. It, it is about personal protective equipment, um, and, uh, but it's also about capacity and having the appropriate staff that are available to surge and having the, the right uh, guidance uh, and, and understanding about best practices. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the, we've obviously got the response work that's ongoing. Uh, by WHO and by partners for uh, the COVID response. Um, uh, earlier uh, this year, the Director General, together with other partners, launched the ACT Accelerator, the Access to 
uh, COVID Tools Accelerator that brought in collaborations with the World Bank, with uh, Gavi, the Global uh, Alliance for Vaccines Initiative, the Global Fund to address HIV, TB, malaria, um, and other global players in, in global health to try and come with a, a joined up approach on uh, getting um, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics uh, into the hands of frontline providers. And obviously, um, for anyone who's uh, had the experience of uh, whether it be the HIV uh, pandemic or even the introduction of things like the rotavirus vaccine or others, um, the idea that you develop a great vaccine, uh, the chemical vaccine, is a long way from actually uh, getting everyone in the world uh, vaccinated. And uh, there's a big estimates, for instance, that some of these early vaccines, you'll need two doses. Uh, that means anywhere from sort of uh, seven to, to 15 billion doses of uh, vaccinations need to happen uh, around the world. And uh, the, we've still got a long way, I think I was explaining in a previous um, uh, session, to even getting some of the basics like measles vaccines to all children around the world. So uh, that was why this health system strengthening uh, crosscut was put in as a foundation there to look at what are some of the foundational elements that need to be there to make sure that these new tools sort of fall on uh, a well-fertilized ground. On the next slide, uh, these the areas that we're working on uh, across the, the different partners, uh, UNICEF and uh, other UN partners, as well as, like I mentioned, World Bank, Gavi, Global Fund, include uh, issues of readiness at the country level, financing, engaging the private sector, how we mobilize the health workforce, um, what is the response in communities and how can we engender more community-led leadership, uh, two key areas of integrated data and clinical care, which I'll come back to, and then work on the supply chain that's for all the other essential uh, supplies that are needed to keep essential services running um, for this. So this particular um, uh, piece of work is going to be really key as we head into later this year and next year with some of the you know, we've had some of the uh, therapeutics already coming, uh, dexamethasone and other um, uh, therapeutics coming online, but there'll be a whole host of them uh, soon and we'll need to be ready for it. So on uh, the next slide, one of the, one of the areas we've been tracking uh, was to come with a more integrated data uh, approach. One of the things for those of you who've worked in global health and those of you who've worked in public health, even in the, in the US, uh, your average uh, frontline provider, whether it be physician, nurse, community health worker, spends a ton of time gathering data rather than seeing patients. And um, whether that be for insurance companies, whether it be for state public health agencies or national uh, agencies or even global efforts, what we were trying to do here, given that all countries around the world, decision makers and providers are just running to try and keep up with this virus, even in countries that have relatively low uh, caseloads was to come with an integrated approach on the, on the data um, collection. Uh, next slide. So we also tried to come with an integrated approach on the clinical care work. Um, and this is particularly relevant for some of the clinicians on the, uh, on the seminar today. Um, you know, one of the difficulties we've heard from, whether it be in the US or uh, in South Africa, uh, patients are presenting, you know, without a diet, they generally present without a diagnosis. Uh, often. Um, they may or may not have COVID. They may have very unspecific uh, symptoms. Um, they, if you're in a malaria endemic region, having a fever doesn't mean a lot of different things. We're heading into Southern Hemisphere. We already have the flu season. We'll head into that in the fall. So that'll be a big complicating factor in terms of syndromic diagnosis. So the key processes of screening, isolation, triage, monitoring, and targeted referral really have to be in place uh, as we as things come back uh, this coming fall. And this particular work stream was really designed to help support uh, countries and local decision makers on how to provide integrated clinical input and then how we can support some of the integration of clinical processes. Now, you know, for me, it's a great um, indication, again, of how this virus doesn't do anything except shine the light on gaps we've had in the past. I worked for years at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, based in Bethesda, then Rockville, Maryland. Uh, we used to study how long did it take, even when CMS was, uh, had a reimbursement um, plan or had a national uh, quality improvement effort, 
um, either at the hospital level or in nursing homes, how long it would take for quality standards, good practice to get uh, disseminated through the system. Uh, and it is uh, and anywhere from two to seven years sometimes would uh, recommended clinical practice um, take to really uh, make it into general practice. And uh, these types of timeframes are really not what we have time for in this particular environment. And so how we can get out to frontline providers recommendations about, for instance, DEXA and oxygen um, in a rapid fashion is something we've never done before. If you talk about having, you know, putting out an RNA virus, uh, in, which has never been done before in the time we're talking about, which has also never been done before, I think we're also overlooking the fact that we're going to have uh, big, just amazing changes in clinical practice for uh, acute respiratory illness um, that are going to have to be supported in, in some ways. And there's no way your average uh, physician is going to be able to follow all of the different uh, recommendations, the gazillion articles that are out there and all the claims, sometimes spurious, um, around different products. So I think that's one of the things we're hoping to be able to sift through and provide some better information. And nowhere is it um, uh, a tougher uh, clinical management uh, scenario than in long-term care. And on the next slide, we, we come to, um, we've just finished a, a guidance on a policy brief on long-term care facilities um, to look at how to prevent uh, transmission and reduce mortality. Um, it's uh, really focused on um, the sort of issues of uh, how at the policy level and, and was a uh, subject of a long review by many different uh, experts um, and that's just gone up on our website over the weekend. Um, the, on the next slide, uh, the main objectives um, were really to provide some of this policy guidance in, and key action points. As people know, and we've talked about here, long-term care in almost every single member state of WHO, if it exists, uh, is highly fractured, it usually in, is um, very heavily dependent on private sector provision. Um, meaning the uh, sort of basic st standards can be very variable. The um, how patients enter or leave long-term care uh, can be through multiple channels, primary care, emergency uh, care. They may come through a retirement facility. They, uh, so there's all sorts of issues. And the staff tend to be, um, uh, come from, tend to be from many different places and also not just work in, long, in one given long-term care facility, all of which is an IPC nightmare. So uh, uh, these are some of the guidance points um, and 11 policy objectives on the next slide sort of lay out some of the key issues that we've uh, put in detail um, in the guide. And we're just now working on an operational guide that's going to boil down some of the care provision elements of this, you know, which is particularly in the seven, eight, nine um, uh, recommendation areas. Uh, and uh, also summarize our IPC guidance and our clinical management of um, COVID for elderly and long-term care patients. Uh, so that's, that'll be coming uh, shortly. And um, at least we're hoping that this provides some uh, basis for national policymakers to be looking at their long-term care and making needed changes, uh, which should be done anyway, but uh, COVID once again gives us the immediate impetus to move quickly on it. And I'll just um, you know, finish before we get to some of the Q&A with some thoughts about you know, what countries are doing or not doing. So, um, all countries globally have been asked to uh, consider, you know, putting together a national response plan for COVID. Most countries um, uh, have such a plan. WHO, uh, we reviewed all those plans are also provided to WHO, and they are in general um, map to our nine pillars of the of our strategic preparedness and response plan for COVID. Um, and we looked at them in particular with trying to understand how well were countries planning, how well have they funded uh, their work. Um, and on the next slide, uh, the, the idea was really to see, you know, did, um, is there alignment between these country plans, which are CPRPs, with the uh, global uh, the plan, which is the SPRP, and, and then also countries that are qualify as humanitarian response uh, uh, countries, the countries like a, a Yemen or Iraq, but there's many uh, countries, there's in the, uh, I think there's 28 total globally. Um, that, so the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, the GHRP, lays those out as well. And we looked at those countries too, and were, were they also 
uh, trying to, to um, address these issues. So um, we looked at the inclusion uh, of essential services there, the quality aspects, and were they, cost, were they well costed? So some of the findings on this, I'm very happy to provide this in more detail if, if uh, people on the call are interested in particular countries or interested in the methodology. But um, on the uh, next slide, the, some of the key messages um, laid out show that, you know, the alignment across all of the pillars and then across the topic areas for the global humanitarian response plan is really quite uh, varied, unfortunately. And there are countries who even not only the gap is not necessarily that they don't have any plan, although that's a few countries, but some of them even have multiple plans, uh, up to four separate plans for COVID, which also uh, can be as damaging as not having any plan at all if you have total confusion over who's doing uh, what. Um, there's a definite room for improving the consideration of essential health services um, in these plans. Uh, many of them deal with the issue of infection prevention and control, something we've talked about a lot um, in these uh, sessions. But uh, only 12% of the plans have a designated person responsible for health services or the health services resilience. So if you don't have anyone responsible for it, it will definitely not get done. So in the entire country, you need at least one person who's looking at uh, maintaining essential services as an, an important piece of work. And only 12% of countries have really specifically allocated funding for this. So um, I'll just finish there, uh, Donna, with this idea that um, you know we clearly have again uh, the uh, something of if you look at um, the Western Pacific, if you look at uh, Europe, which is not quite as far along, you, we are going to have this um, something of an accordion situation where countries start to you know work on opening up uh, and cases will go up, there's uh, you know, no question, and then you'll have to perhaps ratchet back down. And the whole point is to not have this explosion and closure and explosion and closure. And I think uh, this sort of um, assessment, two points, when we had a discussion with um, uh, business leaders on Friday about, um, with questions about, uh, you know, when will the pandemic end? Uh, and, uh, you know, what will happen next? Um, Mike Ryan, who's the head of the uh, emergencies program, and I both said if we could predict when it was going to end, we definitely would not be sitting in these chairs uh, where we were. But the whole point is that the, our word was the virus will, will stop. This outbreak will stop when we make it stop. So we have shown very clearly, very clearly in a bunch of countries that, that uh, public health measures can control the virus. We can control the virus. So uh, the, if we don't control it, then it controls us, that's for sure. And the, um, it's quite clear that we are going to need this uh, uh, the work on the vaccine to continue, that that's gonna be something going into next year. There's a lot of discussion around uh, things like a global uh, glass shortage for um, vials and concerns about countries buying up um, uh, supplies for that, uh, that is, I think, a concern. That's precisely why the ACT Accelerator was put together to get a more equitable um, uh, allotment uh, and allocation approach going. But um, whether that's going to stick or not, I personally have my own, um, how should we put it, uh, uh, skepticism that all countries will just be willing to, to play by the rules. So this is why I think it's really important that we show that uh, you know the strategies that countries can have um, on detection, on, on testing and detection, on case finding, um, using public health measures. Uh, the the full lockdowns are very effective, but very blunt tools that uh, cause a lot of damage elsewhere. And I think that that's one of the messages that we've had from the director general, uh, both today in the press conference that just happened, as well as on uh, last week that um, the tools are in countries' hands and we're working as hard as we can to try and get the, the vaccine and, the, and the, uh, that work forward. Uh, but the, the approach, um, uh, I think we're in for a long haul in terms of looking at um, some of these uh, potential solutions, which is why this issue of you know, safe provision of, of healthcare 
it's got to be really front of mind, again, as this canary in a coal mine for how countries can really progress and keep their economies open. So why don't I pause there, uh, Don, and we can uh, take uh, some questions that very happy to share um, in the chat or offline uh, some of the documents that are referred to. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is related to testing. Now, there has been a lot of questions about the validity of, of the tests. Um, so, for example, if it, it, here in the United States, some people are finding that if somebody tests for COVID more than once, it counts as multiple positive results. Um, is, is, that, is that an issue? Is there, is there a concern about or should we be concerned about the way that we are calculating tests worldwide? Um, yeah, it is something we've talked about uh, uh, here, like that um, some people testing positive more than once for coronavirus. It, it doesn't, I mean, it, it basically doesn't mean that um, you've necessarily that you've been reinfected, but it can uh, um, mean that we, there has been some um, idea that, uh, you know, very weak immune you've had a very weak reaction to the virus that you can be reinfected. Um, but uh, the, I mean, we've had, and also my colleague Maria um, uh, Van Kirkhoff has talked uh, at the press conference even just recently that um, doctors have been finding instances where uh, dead cells that emerged during the healing process of lungs were testing positive for COVID, but it didn't necessarily mean that the individuals were um, reinfected. So whether, from our standpoint, we have not seen any evidence that that's having a big impact on, on numbers, on global numbers, um, we have been looking, and I'm happy to share this offline, uh, doing some deep dives on testing approaches and testing rates across countries. And I think one of the things that, anyway, I'm, I wish more countries, US included, had uh, these types of, um, uh, track this type of information about how much testing they were doing, but then how quickly they were following up tests with uh, calls to potential contacts, these types of issues. But um, uh, the idea that um, the, the test positivity rate, I think is a better indication of whether you're, you know, whether you're getting extra uh, noise in your numbers. And most countries, um, uh, many, many countries are, are seeing their test positivity rate still very high, which means you're still only testing probably very sick people. You need to be testing many, many more people. Okay. Um, question about the, uh, the evidence that you're sharing with everyone. Um, the question is, how do you decide when the evidence is strong enough um, so that you can convey a certain degree of, of, uh, of well, it's just to, to convey the certainty that you have? Yeah. Um, the WHO's process for um, for evidence reviews, uh, and it'll depend, anything that's a guideline process, um, we've sped up immensely in terms of our production, but there is a guideline uh, development committee that's put together of uh, external experts. All those experts are vetted for outside um, declaration of interests and also uh, whether um, they meet standards of objectivity and, and expertise. And then uh, the evidence is compiled sometimes, uh, um, is usually compiled by a methodologist and uh, um, a systematic review is conducted. So that has to meet a certain standard of, of uh, the scope and size. Um, then the, the evidence and the recommendations on the, uh, are actually reviewed by the guidelines development committee and a final guideline put forward. So that's the standard, roughly, the standard process. Um, and we have the guidelines development group, which is a, an internal set of experts that review this. And then under COVID, we, all, we have a, a third um, control, which is the Publications Review Committee, uh, which is led by the editor of the um, bulletin of the WHO and has a set of external and regional experts, uh, st technical staff, who review all of the publications um, to make sure that they are in alignment with uh, existing evidence. So anyway, if that sounds very onerous, it is, um, but that's WHO's process for putting those together. And the idea is that if you do the right things, then on the other end, you're gonna have robust, as robust a, a picture of the evidence as, as possible. But you know, with this um, 
outbreak has really challenged us because stuff happens so fast and it's a novel virus. So like it, that meaning it's new. So the, the, we've had to look at other like viruses, other flu-like viruses and other things. And there's plenty of areas where, where we've said, look, from what the evidence says, I would say take masks. Um, this is what we think uh, we can say now. We may change it down the road. We have, uh, let's see, in March, we said one thing in June, uh, we've, we've expanded to say some of the evidence suggests that in um, constrained environments, it, it could be a good idea to wear masks. Um, so the, I think we'll see a lot of changes over the next year too, as, especially within the therapeutics area as we see, um, as we see uh, new therapeutics coming online. Great. Ed, we are at 7.30, but I have a few more questions. Do you have just a few more minutes? Maybe we can get yeah, yeah, yeah. a few no more problem. in. Okay, great. Um, so um, question from Helen Hughes. Um, she wants to know, how, what can we do to speed up the provision of the guidance to the front line? You, know, you talked about how it takes two to seven years to get it out there um, to, you know, to change practice, but what can we do to speed things up in this scenario? Yeah, well, it, I should be asking Helen that, but anyway, that's a <laughs> great uh, question. She's, uh, anyway, has a lot of um, expertise in this. Uh, the, I think, you know, that's been one of the big uh, challenges, and I mentioned that earlier about even in the U.S. Um, and in traditional, you know, anyway, clinical care, you tend to sort of do what you learned at med school, and then, you know, sort of that's, it's tough to change those practices. Um, but the, in, I think we have a real opportunity now, and this is the interface we talked about a long time ago with uh, uh, digital health uh, for really leapfrogging in some ways some of this um, uh, provision of, of information just because literally every single clinician in the world practically is like so tuned in to this COVID work because they have to be that it provides an opportunity for setting up platforms for rapidly getting out some of these new uh, the data on new diagnostics or on um, you know, what are the risk factors? Uh, you know, for, is obesity uh, a big risk factor or not? Are we seeing higher rates in certain ethnicities or not? And um, everyone's just so attuned right now that I think we have an opportunity that we wouldn't normally uh, have. There's not such a, um, there, at least from what I've seen, there hasn't been such a uh, focus on this and a coming together on this. There's been a lot of focus on data platforms and, um, sort of supply chain platforms, but not so much on like knowledge platforms. So I think this would be, anyway, it's a good, a good area for maybe the foundation and, and some of the colleagues around the world to get into. Great. We'll take you up on that. Good. Yeah. Um, question about long COVID. This is a, a new phenomenon, it seems, that we're hearing about people who have who are experiencing COVID symptoms for months at a time. Are, are, is the World Health Organization doing any research on that? or have any guidance? Yeah, yeah uh, we have looked, um, we started to look a little bit more at, um, uh, you know, what what is the sort of that syndrome and, you know, what does it um, mean? Uh, you know, the there's been a couple of really good articles recently um, on this, BMJ has had something, uh, um, others have had things that but WHO hasn't put anything out on it. We've looked at it from a rehab perspective um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, what does it, what does it mean? And it doesn't, at the moment, there's not so much evidence on, you know, just certain types of patients tend to present with this or, or are they more likely to get this? Um, there was, for a while, there was a discussion around a certain blood type seem to be harder hit than others uh, where it really um, sort of drags out. But um, I think the, the, what I'd seen from the BMJ article was that the, the Royal College of General Practitioners had mentioned to their GPs and other um, colleagues that they should expect, uh, you know, certain influx of patients with long COVID. Um, and I think that uh, it, it'll mean that, that it's both, and I think we should be thinking about both a physical and, and sort of emotional and psychological impact that it can have. Uh, that it just really takes people, certain patients, a really, really long time to come out of this. Um, but uh, this, again, is one of those possibilities where new therapeutics will eventually have some kind of uh, impact. But I, I would expect us to do something on this within the next few weeks. Great. Uh, another question was related to the vaccines. Do you have any idea how the, the vaccines are produced? Are they cell-based? I know you talked about an RNA vaccine. There's probably several different, different kinds, but had some questions about how they're produced. 
Yeah, um, the uh, for me, I am not personally a vaccine uh, expert, but um, we have uh, a ton of those at the uh, at the organization. Mo a bunch of the leading um, candidates are RNA vaccines uh, that are out there. You know, we now have four or five in, that are in um, uh, headed into phase three uh, trials, uh, and you know the the fact that we've come that quick uh, along this, I think is, is uh, pretty amazing. Um, the, I think also there's been a lot of talk about, oh, are we cutting corners on safety and these types of uh, issues? Um, you know, there was, um, uh, there's been a couple of really good interviews with some of the lead, uh, lead folks for the vaccines. A great one with uh, colleagues at Oxford uh, about the fact that actually technically, if there was um, sort of semi-unlimited funding and global attention, any vaccine could potentially be produced at this fast. It's just that in the typical process, it, uh, it takes much longer. The regulatory agencies um, don't run parallel checks on things and this kind of stuff. So um, the main message is that the process is the same as it, as it will be for any vaccine that's been produced uh, up till now. It's just that um, the global attention and funding has meant we've been able to speed things up astronomically. So whether that, anyway, it's still, we've never, as people know, there's never been an RNA vaccine that's been delivered to market. So that's a, <laughs> anyway, that's a little bit of a daunting element, but I think the fact that there's so much attention on this means we're, that this is going to be one of the first ones. Great. And then a, a question about the spread of, of COVID. You know, a lot of folks have been locked down in their homes for some time, but they're still very concerned about, about being able to, you know, to catch the virus. Um, so can you just talk a little bit of, um, for folks who are staying at home, what is their risk for catching COVID when they are following all of the recommendations? Yeah, it's very, I mean, nor, it really depends on, you know, what your community situation is. Um, if, you know, we still talk about, um, in terms of the epi situation of having isolated cases, um, uh, sort of to clusters of cases to community spread, um, and you know many countries sort of sort of slid between those. Uh, and the bottom line is that um, if your you know community does not have sort of widespread uh, and, and really high numbers then um, you know, if you do the right things in terms of, uh, you know, when you go out, you practice really good hand hygiene. If you're in a crowded, you have to be in a crowded space, you know, bringing a mask with you. Certain, most communities, many communities now have requirements on wearing masks. Um, and uh, that, you know, you are able to isolate yourself uh, appropriately. The risk can be really manageable. Um, the, I think, of course, you know, anyway, it's going to be a bit of a marathon, as we've seen. We'll be into next year, most likely, uh, that we'll be, have some kind of having to be thinking about this. And I think probably we should be uh, thinking about this as just, you know, this is going to be the way that probably a sort of cleaner, healthier me is going to live in the world uh, and that I'm really going to cut down on my winter colds and uh, any sort of stomach bugs that I get and this kind of stuff because I'm going to be much more careful about um, infections and that kind of thing. Now, um, whether or not the French will give up the kissing on two cheeks uh, permanently is really <laughs> going to be tough to say. So I think there's certain practices that will die hard, but um, but I think your average person can really do a lot in terms of taking care of themselves. Uh, and anyway, by the way, that means not just like preventing the infections and staying home. It also means really uh, taking care of yourself mentally, because I know a lot of colleagues who either they're single, they live on their own, they're teleworking and it's very, and, you know, it can be very difficult. So um, mm -hmm. uh, finding ways to, to uh, get out, see friends safely um, in an innovative way, that's really important. Great. Well, Ed, as always, you have brought us some fabulous information. We thank you so very much. And uh, looking forward to having you back again, I hope, soon. Yeah, good. Well, let's, uh, let's plan on it. We'll definitely um, come back to uh, some of the, um, uh, some of the, the uh, documents that I shared. And it was great to uh, see some of the people who are on here and 
thanks to, uh, particularly to John for some of the references to some great, very good uh, um, references that people should definitely uh, read. So if you haven't uh, followed the chat, please do. Excellent. And Kaylee will make sure that we have all of those links um, on, on our website when we post the video. Okay. Good. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, Ed. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day.